guys, welcome to Urology Biology. Now on this channel, I like to restore vintage watches back to their former glory. And on this particular episode, I have got in an Omega Seamaster from 1956. Reference number 2846-7SC with the caliber 501 inside. Now this watch actually belongs to my neighbor, which was previously owned by his late father and had actually been locked away for many, many years. I took a quick look at it and I noticed that it was a complete non-runner. Now my first impressions were that the mainspring had completely died, but as we're going to see, there's a few other things that's going on inside. So as usual, I am going to fully strip this watch down, I'm going to clean everything, I'm going to rebuild it and I'm going to oil it and get it back up into a running condition. Now what you might actually notice that I'm doing here is I'm masking up and there's a clear reason behind this. This is actually a radium dialed watch. So when I'm dealing with something like this, which is not often because I do not like touching them at all, I will take the precautions involved. As you also saw, I was using my Geiger counter to check the readings on this. And to be honest, it wasn't really high at all. Now I actually own an Omega Seamaster of the same era with a fully radium dialed and hands, and it turns out some really big numbers on the Geiger counter. On this one, it was actually quite low. And the reasons behind this were, was that somehow or later on during the journey of this watch, the hands are actually tritium, but the dial loom dots are actually radium. So therefore there's not as much radium on there as I originally thought, which I'm quite relieved about because I don't like messing around with that stuff. No, sir. So I will actually take the precautions involved. So I'm wearing a mask to actually disassemble the first part of this watch and obviously get the hands and the dial out of the way. First thing is I've removed the rotor from the watch before I take it out and then I'm removing the two movement holder clamps which are held in by two screws on either side. I can then lift off the case, revealing this dial and it's actually really really nice. It's a creamy creamy white and it's not being burnt by the radium at all so I'm really really happy to see that. I've covered the dial with some plastic and then I'm slowly just releasing the hands from the cannon pinion. Putting my uh, hand reliever tools to one side and then I can just carefully remove these hands away from the watch. And like I just mentioned, these hands are 100% tritium hands because I did test them and they are not revealing any kind of numbers whatsoever. Then I'm just going to lightly just clean off any of this excess dust uh, which is lying on top of the dial. And then I'm carefully just putting the Rodico that I've used into a disposable plastic bag because I'm going to bin that later on. Now the dial is held on with the two dial feet screws, one on each side, which I've slowly removed. And then I can lift the dial completely from the movement and then pop it into a dial case, which is exactly what I've done. The hands are also in there as well, just to keep them safe and out of the way. Now any tissues that I've basically used to wipe my bench down, which you haven't actually seen on the camera, but that's what I did. I just used some alcohol and just wiped off my bench just to clean my working area so that now I can get on with the full disassemble of the watch in a cleaner environment. First thing I always do is once the dial's been removed, I will remove the cannon pinion and then I will flip the movement over to remove the balance from the movement. Held in with just the one screw, as you can see, I'm gonna slowly just pry that off with a, a screwdriver and then lift it off with my tweezers. Now balance is actually in pretty good condition. I'm not seeing any heavy, heavy wear with this. So I need to find out exactly why the watch is not running at all. Next, I am going to remove the pallet fork bridge or cock, should I say, because it's just the one screw and then I can remove the pallet forks as well. Now, the automatic works is held on with these two screws, as you can see, and I've just removed those and then I can lift this off and put it to one side. And it looks like it's bridge after bridge with this movement, as you can see. Next, I'm removing the ratchet wheel, and it's quite a beefy ratchet wheel. There's two wheels involved with this because of the automatic works. And what I actually noticed was, which you're not going to see on camera, was there was a lot of tension that released once I pulled this off from the mainspring barrel. So my suspicions are now that the mainspring is not actually broken at all, and it was just actually really gunked up. And if you look on top of the arbor, there is a lot of gunk on there from old dried oil, and that's probably what seized it up. Next, I'm removing this additional bridge, which is lying on top of the train of wheels bridge. Held in with the two screws, 
And I can just lift that off carefully and put that to one side. Now underneath this you see that there's the pinion where the seconds hand sweeper is going to sit and you need to remove that very carefully because the last thing that you want to do is bend that. If you bend that, it's not super fresh. No sir, it's not. You'll be a whole heap of trouble moving forward. There's actually a friction spring as well which sits on top of it which holds it in place as you can see. Now to me this looked like a normal driving wheel and this is where I actually made a mistake. It's not a driving wheel at all, it's just a third wheel which has got two wheels on it instead of one. Now it's quite an easy mistake to make when you're working on many movements because it's not uncommon that you wouldn't find a driving wheel on a movement of this age. And there was actually no reason for me to remove that away from the rest of the third wheel. Now later on, I didn't actually show it on the video but it basically just put it back together with my staking set. And for people who are actually members of the channel, there is actually the full unedited version of this, which is around three hours long, which is actually on the channel right now, if you do decide to become a member or not. It's under no obligation, of course, but if you do, you get entitled to all that extra super HP goodness with those extra long videos, which, yeah, can be quite long. Like I said, this one, I think it's around three and a half hours, something like that. So I've removed the crown wheel, the crown wheel core and the crown washer underneath. Also the ratchet wheel, the click, the click spring, all been removed. And now I can remove these three screws that are holding the barrel bridge in place. And underneath you can actually see the mainspring barrel. And it does look in actually good condition. So I'm kind of happy about that. Yeah. The winding pinion and the sliding pinion, of course, they've popped out now because nothing's holding them in place. So they can also be removed. And I'll continue with the strip down of the watch. Now on the dial side, we've got the keyless works. I've just removed the setting lever, spring, also the minute wheel. There's a small intermediate wheel as well that's just been removed. And then you've got the rest of the keyless works. Holding down the yoke spring so it doesn't fly across the room. And then I can remove the yoke as well. Now just removing this friction spring that's holding the setting lever down. And then I can just literally just Pull that off and then remove the setting lever underneath as well. So guys, don't forget, I am giving away a Roma Stingray vintage chronograph watch from the 1960s with a Valju 72 inside. Now this watch is easily valued within the $2,000 range and of course I'm going to be giving it away to one lucky subscriber of the channel once we hit 100,000 subscribers. And I would really appreciate it if you did subscribe to the channel. It would really help me out. It costs you absolutely nothing. And when I look at my statistics, around 80% of the people that watch my material are actually not subscribed to the channel. So please, by all means, if you could do me a favor, hit that subscribe button and I would be mass appreciated. So we virtually stripped down the entire core components of this watch. We stripped down the main, main plate. We have stripped down the automatic works. And the only thing that's really left to do after this is to remove the mainspring from the barrel, remove the arbor and check that out to see if it's in decent condition. And I'm pleasantly surprised to see that there's nothing drastically going wrong so far. Fingers crossed. But of course with vintage watches, you never, never know. Removing the arbor from the mainspring barrel and then I can see that it's not actually that gunked up inside so it's not going to take that much cleaning. I'm also going to remove the mainspring of course and then I'm going to basically peg wood absolutely everything as you've seen on a lot of my previous videos. So of course the case will get ultrasonically cleaned as well. And it's the best opportunity to show all of the names of the HP members of the channel and the Patreons, of course. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you. And I hope you see all of your names upon the screen. Simply drop in the case components into the ultrasonic. It's preheated and then I can give it a blast for around eight minutes to clean the case. Now, by no means am I a professional when it comes to case polishing under no shape or form. But this is a gold cap case and the condition of it was pretty, pretty run down. So I want to buff this up and bring back that nice luster to it of how it originally looked. I do not want to remove all of the original scratches whatsoever because it's a vintage watch, but because it's very thick, uh, the plating, sorry, is very thick on these vintage Omegas, 
there's no reason at all why it shouldn't be given a really nice buffing up on the mop to bring it up to a really, really nice shine of how it originally looked. And this machine that I've got does a really, really good job. It has got four inch mops, one on each side, and I'm really, really happy with the results that I get. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't remove the crown tube from the case because it had been flattened on on the inside and there was literally no way of driving it out. So I had to do it with it still on, which is not best practice, I have to say. But luckily with this, I still pulled off a pretty decent job. As you're going to see at the end, the case looks mm, super shiny and super fresh. Mm, you could eat your dinner off of this. I also buffed up the case back as well on the mop and now I'm going to add the brushing to the center area of the case back. And the easiest way to do this is using it with a movement holder, use a straight piece as I'm using this main spring box so that I can keep it straight and then I just drive it along a piece of sandpaper. This sandpaper is around 1,200 grit and then you can just get a brushed effect just on the center area. Now it's not the best job in the world that I've got with this as far as I'm concerned, but it looks a hell of a lot more presentable than it originally did. Now I'm also fitting a brand new crystal to the watch, which is a little bit of a shame because the original one was an original crystal with the Omega logo in the middle, but there was too much crazing on that crystal, so it just had to go. So the only way around this is to fit a new one. Now I am using my Bergeon press. These are really expensive, but I will be honest with you guys, I cannot stress how really, really good they are. You get such a nice clean drive with crystals and they're just so much easier to fit than any other kind of generic crystal press. It's a lot of money, but it will last you a lifetime. So I cannot really recommend them enough. So now we can obviously start with a full rebuild. Everything has been cleaned, everything is ready to go so we can rebuild the watch. And what I'm doing is I'm fitting the mainspring into my winder and I run into a problem. The hole which clicks into the winder is actually too small to fit over the little hook. So I'm left with absolutely no choice but to do this by hand. And I'm actually pretty good at doing this. Now a lot of people frown upon this, but when you have no choice, you have no choice. That mainspring needs to go into that barrel. And if you are careful and you take your time, you will be able to do this pretty good. And it's one of those things that will just take practice. So once the mainspring is in the barrel, then I can offer the arbor to the barrel and gently just put that into place. Add in a little bit of 1300 on each side of the arbor. And I also add in a little bit of 1300 on top of the mainspring as well, just to give it some extra lubrication. Obviously the barrel has been fully greased with chrono grease as well as you previously saw. And now I can put on the barrel bridge. Simply just friction fit and you just click that into place. Next, of course, in the way that I do things, I will tackle the jewels on top and underneath the balance. Carefully just lifting off the inker block spring and then I can remove the capstones with a little piece of Rodico. Now clean off the excess dried oil from underneath and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some fixer drop treatment as well so that the oil doesn't disperse everywhere. And of course I use a little bit of 9010. Now with these Omega ones they actually put a little bit of a guide circle on there so you know exactly how much oil to put on which is quite good because not many watches offer that on their capstones. Close it back into place and then pop it back into the movement. Close the inker block, which is held in with those two little shock levers, one on each side. And then of course I just clean off any dust off top with some Rodico. The process is completely repeated as well on the dial side, which I'm not showing on this uh, short video, but the principle is exactly the same guys. You just repeat the process on the opposite side of the movement. Once that's been done, I can remove the balance from the movement as obviously I do not need it anymore until we get towards the end of the build. And I just want to pop that upside down so that there's no stress on the staff and just put it away until later on. Add in a little bit of 1300 as well for where the center wheel is going to go and of course for the arbor of the mainspring. 
pop in the barrel and then I can put on this barrel bridge on top as well. Now this barrel bridge is held in with three screws which does surprise me actually because there's not really much to it so why they needed three instead of two is beyond me but it is what it is. Now I can of course build up the trains adding in the escape wheel, uh, the seconds and the thirds wheels and of course the center wheel. Now the center wheel goes in before the third wheel which is not always the case and as you can see it's a little bit fiddly because there's two parts to it and of course like I mentioned earlier on the video I didn't need to remove uh, the top part of it. Now the trainer wheels bridge I have to carefully slide this and sandwich it in between the third wheel but it's not too difficult and obviously everything lines up correctly and snaps into place. So I'm adding a little bit of grease now on top of this crown wheel washer. And then I can put the crown wheel on on top. I also add as well a little bit of 1300 just into the groove for where the core is going to live. It just gives it some extra lubrication because this is something which is obviously going to get moved a lot when you're winding the watch. And then I can offer the core to the movement. Now it's held in with one screw and it's not a reversed threaded screw. And the trick here is, is because it's not bang in the center. You can see that. And because it's not in the center, it's not a reverse threaded screw. Add in the friction spring in for where the seconds pinion is going to go and I'm adding a little bit of 1300 as well onto the post of it. Gently sliding that into place and being extra careful with it as well. It is a really delicate piece and as I stressed before, you do not want to bend that. No sir, you do not. It would not be cool. Next I add in the additional bridge which will hold everything in place. You can see the two jewels there for that third wheel and also that center pinion. And then that's held in with those two screws. Sometimes also, as you can see, you use a little bit of pegwood to guide your screws in place. Now for the oil aid, I'm using 9010 on all of the jewels, but for the center wheel, it will be 1300. Now people have commented on my oiling before and said, HB man, you seem pretty good at the oiling. I think it's a combination of two things. One, I have a pretty steady hand. And secondly, I have good magnification. And good magnification is really, really important when it comes to oiling. Zoom in, guys. I cannot stress it enough. You want to oil just a tiny little bit and just make sure that it's bang in the middle. You don't want that oil to spill everywhere. It's messy. And you want to give this watch you know, the best shot it can get at running for a long time. I repeat the process on the other side, of course, and then I've added a little bit of grease for where the cannon pinion is going to go and then just snap that on, which of course is friction fit. Switching the movement back over now and adding 1300 for where the ratchet wheel is going to go and also for where the click. Add in the click spring and the click and that's held in with that one little tiny screw. So lining up the ratchet wheel and it's it's a double ratchet wheel as you can see and it is quite chunky it's got a very very long screw for this and then of course just tightening everything up and making sure everything is engaged correctly next of course adding some fixer drop to the pallet forks which i thought i'd lost as you could see with the expression on my face <laughs> seriously i looked in i was like where the hell is it And then I'm also just going to clean off any excess or fix a drop from the uh, pinions of the um, pallet forks because you want to reduce any kind of friction when the watch is being used. Add in on the pallet cock and that's held in with just the one screw. Now 
Now be really careful when you tighten these up. Don't over tighten them. Just tighten it as much as it will possibly go without being, you know, too violent, let's say. I added a little bit of winding as well so that I can get some movement into this so that now, of course, I can oil the exit stone of the pallet fork. I do this in a combination of three steps. I move it around five or six times so that all of the teeth get a little bit of oil on the escapement. Next, of course, I can add in the uh, balance cock with the balance wheel. And then we can see, of course, if the watch is going to fire up. And considering it was a non-runner, I, of course, I'm hoping it's going to run now. And there is life in the old dog. Very, very happy to see this. And we're looking like we've got some decent amplitude as well, which is really, really nice. So the movement's been flipped over and I'm going to add a little bit of 1300 to all of the posts for where the minute wheel will go, the intermediate wheel, of course, the setting lever. All of these get a little bit of 1300 treatment because lubrication is so important when it comes to your watches, guys. Don't forget, when you have metal on metal contacts, you need to lubricate them accordingly. Now, if you're unsure exactly what and where you're supposed to lubricate, there are certain websites where you can find original tech documents for movements. And a lot of these tech documents do give you the points of where you should be lubricated the watch. Cousins, for example, is a good website for finding tech docs. If you go into their search bar, you can actually type in the uh, model number or the caliber number of the watch. And a lot of the time you will find a tech doc as a PDF, which you can just download. And usually what I've been doing over the years is I just sort of build up my own collection of watches that I've serviced and I will just save them for future reference. They don't cost you anything and I definitely advise doing it. So like I said, a lot of the ones that I get come from cousins um, and yeah, it's completely valuable information that you're going to use for many years to come. So I've added a little bit of grease as well, of course, to the contacts for where the setting lever spring is. And I'm just checking that everything's engaging. And then most importantly, cleaning off any excess grease that's been stained that I've left behind. And the watch is building up really, really nice. And I'm well happy about how this is going. And I'm sure my neighbor's going to be pretty chuffed about it too. Tackling the automatic works now and I'm building that back up. First, I've just added in the plate for where the rotor is going to live, and that's held in with those three screws. Next, of course, I'm adding in this spring and this other additional lever, which locks it into place for when it's moving. And that's just held in with the one screw. Now, these can be a little bit fiddly, so pegwood is your friend. Seriously, get used to using pegwood. A sharp piece of pegwood or a plastic stick is so useful for holding things into place. Also adding these two wheels in place. And then there is a small bridge which lives on top, making sure that the jewels are aligned correctly with the pinions, which they are. I mean, there's only two, or no, sorry, there's three, as I can see there. And then that's held in with two screws. Again, using pegwood to hold everything into place. Now, once you've done that, you can turn the watch over and offer it to the movement. Now, what I do is when I'm lowering it on, I don't just slam it on and screw it down. I also use the crown to wind in. And what you find is, is if you do this, it will actually work itself into its correct place. And you're not going to do any damage when you do this. And it really is the best way to do it as far as I'm concerned. Of course, a new gasket is going to be fitted to the case pack. Now, with these particular type of Omega watches, these gaskets actually go to the inside of the case back, similar to the bumper movements as well. And they're really easy to fit. They're a lot easier than fitting it in the traditional method. So I'm a big fan of the way that these were done. They work from a compression aspect. So when you press the case back on, they will push outwards against themselves. The gasket will push against itself and create a nice, good seal. So the only thing now, of course, we need to do is fit the dial and fit the hands, of course, to the watch. 
And this dial is really nice. It's got this really nice creamy kind of off-white look to it. The condition is really, really good. And it's held in with just these two dial feed screws, one on each side, simply just nips it up and it just keeps the dial in place without it moving around. Now I can offer these Dauphine hands to the watch. Very, very simple. You've just got the hour, the minute and the seconds hand. And then I'm simply just putting it on anywhere I want because there's no date. And then I can align it up to 12 o'clock, ready for the minute hand. Same principle with the minute hand. Line it up to 12 on top of the hour, making sure that you've got it bang on. And then you can just press that on with your hand press tool. Now the second hand as well, I'm using a little piece of Rodico because this was a very thin hand and it actually slipped a lot from my tweezers. Again, pressing it with the hand press tool and then just making sure that none of the hands are touching. Everything is lined up really, really nicely and the movement is ticking away. Casing up the watch now and we're really getting towards the end. So thank you so much for sticking with me if you're still here. I appreciate it. And I'm really getting close to the end results of this watch. Adding in a new gasket for the crown as well. And then, of course, I'm going to just drive back on this little, it's like a metal washer, which lives on top of the crown. It had come out, which was a good thing because it actually gave me a way of getting to the gasket underneath. And I'm actually just going to drive this on and just hammer press it back onto the crown, which again is friction fit. I'm not actually sure if this was something that was supposed to have come out, but it had. Uh, but it was pretty simple to just to drive it back on. Fit in the crown back onto the watch, and then I can just fit in these two uh, movement holder clamps, one on each side, both held in with two screws. And then I can just nip those up. And what you find is when you nip them up, it will raise the entire movement slightly, which is also what you want because then your hands are getting further away from the crystal. Little 1300 onto the post for where the rotor is going to go. And I can just offer that to the movement. A lot of rotors have a screw in the middle, but with these old Omegas, it'll have like a, yeah, like a little lever that goes in and holds it in place. And then you can just nip that up with one small screw. And it means obviously that it's locking that rotor from coming away from itself. And I love the, con the, the color of these old movements, these old rosy gold colors. They look so damn nice. Fit in the case back. And as a special treat as well for my neighbor, I found an old, uh, new old stock strap in brown with a old Omega uh, gold buckle. So I'm going to put that onto the watch as well so that it really sets it off and makes it look nice. So let's check it out on the timographer. The amplitude's actually pretty damn good. Late 260s, 270s. Beat error is under one millisecond, so I'm really happy with that. And we got a rate around minus five, minus seven. Of course, it's not fully regulated yet. I'll do this after 24 hours, but as it was a non-runner, I'm really happy with what we've got so far. And there we have it, guys. The Omega Seamaster from 1956. Looking super shiny. Mmm, that case. So shiny, so fresh. Guys, thank you so much for sticking with me on the video. And of course, if you are bored and you have got nothing else to do right now, there is some more super fresh, nice, watchy goodness on the screen right now for you to watch until your heart's content. And as always, guys, until next time.